It is now time for question period, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, my uh, question is to the Minister of uh, Children, Community and Social Services. Yesterday, parents from across Ontario came to implore the Ford government to help their families with treatment for children with autism, treatments that can cost as much as $80,000 a year. They are at their wits' end, unsure of how to cope with the government's changes. And last night on CTV News, the minister responded by suggesting that they could use the woefully inadequate government support to buy an iPad. Is that the Ford government's idea of a treatment plan, Speaker, an iPad? Wow. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, Speaker. Um, our plan is built on choice. And if parents think that a technological aid will help advance their child, then I want to support them in doing that. Let me read from some of the parents who've written to us about this program. Monica, a mom of an autistic teen, appreciates the new plan offers services to a range of children. Quote, my son was always deemed too high functioning to receive funding, but he needed OT. I ended up taking OT classes at the University of uh, Toronto Scarborough and doing it myself. All of this plan will help her, uh, her son. Speaker, I understand that there are a lot of parents that are concerned about this plan, but there are a lot of parents who are going to be relieved with this plan because 23,000 children were languishing Spons. on a wait list, and my obligation is to support all children, not just 25%. Supplementary. Speaker, after the Premier promised families so much, this Premier has done, done nothing and to offer anything to parents. The promises were big, but the result was nil. All they've done is given the families of this province who have children with autism the expectation to have no hope. That's what they said yesterday. Give up hope. There's no hope left for you. In fact, that's literally what the minister said. No parent should have any hope. Meanwhile, parents who joined us yesterday are planning to sell their homes, cash in life savings, just to provide the support that the Ford government has yanked from them. When her party needed those parents' votes, the minister was happy to offer hope, Speaker. But now that she has the minister's office, she has nothing to offer at all. How can she justify that? Minister? I appreciate the leader of the official opposition wants to uh, you know, play politics and score political points off the backs of vulnerable families. There are 23,000 children in this province who have gone without support. We have increased funding in this ministry. The budget used to be $256 million. I have increased it during a time when the previous Liberal le government left us with a $15 billion deficit to $321 million. And during that period of time, I made a commitment to the parents that were currently receiving service that we would continue their funding throughout Christmas and had to go to Treasury Board for an emergency $102 million so that 25 per cent of the children who were receiving support could continue to re receive support. But if the member opposite is suggesting that I should do what the previous Liberal government did and ignore 75 per cent of the four children in the province of Ontario with autism, think again. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, what I wouldn't expect from a Minister of the Crown is to tell parents to just forget about having any hope for the future for the services and treatments that their kids need. That's what I would not expect from a Minister of the Crown. Parents from across Ontario feel they've been betrayed by this Ford government. Yesterday, the Premier removed the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston from the government caucus for insulting parents with rude and dismissive comments. But frankly, Randy Hillier's insulting comments didn't hurt families as much as the minister's heartless scheme. And his comments weren't nearly as offensive as a minister who threatens autism advocates right. when they refuse to endorse her changes. Does the minister agree with the Premier's decision to suspend the member from caucus? And if so, why doesn't she think that she should also be resigning from Cabinet? Exactly. <laughs> Before I ask the minister to respond, I'll remind the House that we refer to members by their writing names or by their ministerial title. As it, uh, can, uh, depending on the situation, Minister, respond. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thanks again to the member opposite for her question. Um, but I, I, I remain resolute in the fact that three out of four children in this province have been denied service from their Ontario government, which is why 
I went to the Treasury and I asked for an increase in funding during a very difficult time in this province's financial history. We have now increased the budget to $321 million. We are uh, doubling our investment into diagnostic hubs so we can get quicker diagnoses for children at a much earlier age. We believe in early intervention, which is why we're going to front end a lot of money for children between the ages of zero and five, where we know support will help them the best they possibly can. We're going to a direct funding model so that parents can be enabled and empowered to choose the best services for their parents. So, Speaker, when I hear from the member opposite try to play politics with these families in a very difficult order. file, I am very disappointed with them. Position come to order. And I Response. remain committed to implementing this government's plan. Thank you. Next question, Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Minister of Children and Community and Social Services. You know, the parents who joined us here yesterday and today aren't demanding the impossible, Speaker. They simply want the support that their children were promised by, Mr. F by the Premier. Uh, with their therapy, with therapy and treatment, children who seem to be uh, in their own worlds are able to communicate. Uh, they're able to feed themselves. They're able to tell their own parents that they love them. No parent should have to choose between selling their home and denying that to their children. But the minister is not only doing that; she's telling parents that they should be happy. Does she think that's acceptable, Speaker? Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Sarah, who wrote in to Autistics for Autistics. She said what the province had available under the old o o OAP wouldn't be useful for my daughter. I paid out of pocket for everything. She's anxious to see what the new program will offer. Why? because we're empowering parents with choice, whether that is with behavioral support, whether that is with technological aids, whether that is with caregiver uh, training or respite support. We're offering choice. But more importantly than anything, Speaker, we're looking at the 23,000 children who are languishing on a wait list with an endless no hope in sight for support for them and we are going to lift them up and provide them with support by investing in the diagnostic hubs with, with doubling that investment, ensuring Response. that we have more support for Northern Ontario, and ensuring that they have a direct fund so they can choose what works best for their child. I won't apologize for that. Members will please take their seats. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker. It doesn't empower people when you take away their choices, and that's what this government's doing. The choice they're leaving these families with is to sell their home to provide treatment. The choice they're leaving these families with is to cash in their RRSPs to provide treatment for their kids. The only people that have choice are the wealthy, who can afford to provide the services for their children. We don't ask them to provide cancer services to their kids, do we, Speaker? Nope. No, and we shouldn't ask them. to be more interested in the support that families can provide her than supporting them. Whether it's threatening a group of behaviour analysts with four long years if they don't publicly support a new funding system or claiming to have the support of organisations for which they don't have support, the minister has made it clear where her priorities lie. Why is she more interested in de delivering positive headlines for herself and her government rather than delivering results for children with autism and the family members that love them? Members will please take their seats. Minister. I get she's angry. The whole place here gets that she's angry. But I'll tell you something that angered me. Opposition come to order. Order. Ontario order. Were support by their Ontario government. That's what angered me. That's why I'm acting. Those 23,000 children who were languishing on a wait list, who are being ignored by the New Democrats, who were ignored by the Liberals, those are my focus. I'm clearing the wait list. In Member for Essex, come to order. Increasing diagnostic hub support. We're going to directly fund parents so that they have more choice for their child. But let me be perfectly clear, and I say this to the member opposite. If you think it's fine to ignore 75 per cent of the children in this province who have autism, that's your prerogative. But this government will stand for this. I'll remind all members once again, this is the Provincial Parliament of Ontario. 
you make your comments through the chair, even in question period, at all times. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Here it looks like the minister mistook my disgust for something else. Parents are desperate for the treatment and therapy that their children need to thrive. But that was clear yesterday. That's been clear for years and years and years, and the sad thing is this minister knows it. Treatment and therapy that the vast majority of them couldn't dream of paying for themselves, and she knows that as well, Speaker. Treatment and therapy that they are selling their homes and remortgaging and going deeply into debt in order to provide. And she knows that too. Instead of offering help, however, the Ford government tells parents that there's no point in having any hope. Right. Yesterday, an MPP was booted from the government caucus for insulting parents. But my question to the minister is this. Isn't it more insulting to tell these parents that they should give up hope and settle in for four long years? Minister. I understand she wants to portray a certain narrative speaker. The problem is, however, when I saw the wait list of 23,000 children, there was Opposition no come to order. So we increased the budget for this program from $256 million to $321 million. We are doubling our investment into diagnostic hubs at CHEO, at Erin Oak, at Holland Bloorview, and other places, including in the north. We are going to enable and empower families to have a childhood budget where they will work with Autism Ontario, who we signed a $700,000 contract with to help navigate the system so mums and dads can best utilize that support. We're going to provide choice. Parents say that sometimes ABA doesn't work for their child, but they would like a technological aid, such as those that I've seen across the province as I toured children's treatment Response. centers. So, Speaker, please understand this. This is a very important priority for this government. That's why this plan will be implemented, and that's why we'll clear the this way for 18 months. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Minister of Health, but I, I do have to say that this is not about a narrative. It's about children with autism. Right. That's right. Look in the mirror over there, Minister. Look in the mirror. Uh, patients across Ontario are worried about the Ford government's plans to create a mega-agency with a, a mandate to privatize in our health care system. Can the minister tell us what frontline health staff she's consulted as she's developed Order. this plan, or is she still denying that the plan exists? The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I can absolutely tell the Leader of the Opposition that we are not looking at privatization. What we are looking at is strengthening our public health care system. You know and I know that there are concerns, there are gaps, there are problems in our public health care system as people are transitioning from hospital to home care or to long-term care. First of all, we know there aren't enough long-term care spots. There's 30,000 people in Ontario waiting for a long-term care spot. We have 1,200 people every day in hospitals across Ontario that are receiving care in hallways and storage rooms in hospitals. And we know that there are thousands of people waiting for mental health and addictions treatment. So what we are looking at is a transformative plan, but it is to strengthen our public health care system Here. where people will continue to use their OHIP cards to pay for their services. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Um, of course, today we are joined in the legislature by the registered nurses from across Ontario. Many of the members in the chamber introduced them this morning, and we're very These nurses provide the sort of care that makes a real difference for patients. Their focus today is not on creating a new health mega-agency or more for-profit care in our health care system. It's investing in primary care and calling on government to fill the 10,000 nursing vacancies in Ontario hospitals. The Ford government has found money to pay Reuben Devlin to help sell privatization plans. When will they listen to nurses and start investing in frontline staff for our hospitals uh, because we need them desperately if we're going to tackle hallway medicine? Well, as 
As I indicated to the uh, Leader of the Official Opposition, Mr. Speaker, we are intending to strengthen our public health care system. Yeah. We are looking to we are continuing our consultations with health service providers and with patients and families. Those consultations started from the day that I was declared and sworn in as Minister of Health, and those conversations continue to this day. I have also had the opportunity to tour a number of our hospitals and speak with the health care professionals that are providing care in the front line. They don't want to be taking care of patients in hallways. That's not what they were trained to do. It's putting incredible stress on them as well as on the patients and families that are receiving care. We want to end hallway medicine. We want to make sure that we can get people timely or access to treatment. And we want to make sure that people continue to feel connected to their health care system throughout their lives. That is what we are Response. working on, and that is what we are going to deliver to the people of Ontario. Thank you. Next question. Member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Last month, I hosted a community awareness uh, night about human trafficking in my riding of Chatham, Kent Leamington. Despite the subject matter being heavy, the event was, the event was a success with over 600 in attendance. My motive was to keep my community safe from these predators, as I'm sure it is for all of us here in the legislature. Attendees were shocked to hear from local police, social workers, and survivor support networks about how deep the crisis of human trafficking runs in Ontario and how young women and girls of all backgrounds, some as young as 12, are being forced into sex work. Given that tomorrow is Human Trafficking Awareness Day, can the minister explain how our government plans to bring awareness to this issue? Question. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. I, I really appreciate the uh, dedication the member from Chatham-Kent uh, has put into this, uh, this issue, and I was very impressed that he had 600 people attend uh, his public meeting, and I'm looking forward to going back into his community to continue to support the work that he's doing. Obviously, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the great work that the Labour Minister, Lori Scott, did in opposition for uh, ensuring that we have this day enshrined in the and there's been a number of other members in this uh, assembly uh, that have been doing some great work. So let me tell you, and let me start with what we're going to do. We made an historic investment into violence against women uh, just before Christmas, $174 million that we are investing uh, not only to support violence against women, but also to eradicate sex trafficking in our communities. I held a roundtable with a member from Renfrew, who is our, who is our natural resources minister, and I have I have, I'm working with the federal government at a task table, Response. and I'm very excited, and I'm going to be mentioning this more tomorrow, but today uh, the member from Cambridge and the member from Mississauga Centre will be embarking on roundtable discussions throughout the province in order to eradicate them. Supplementary, the member for Cambridge. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for her response and for taking such a strong stance against sex trafficking, ensuring that our government works to educate Ontarians about this horrific practice. The sad reality is that this is a crime that impacts children. About a quarter of victims of sex, sex trafficking are under the age of 18. It even impacts our most vulnerable, including the homeless, who are targeted because they are particularly unguarded. Traffickers exploit their vulnerabilities and trap them in a cycle of abuse. Even when these girls manage to escape, the effects are long-lasting. It's a crime that doesn't discriminate. It can happen in our biggest cities and our smallest towns. Speaker, my question is twofold. First, what is the minister doing to ensure young girls across Ontario are safe? And second, what actions are being taken for those fleeing violence in rural areas? Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. That's a very important question, and I want to congratulate the member uh, from Cambridge, who's my parliamentary assistant, as well as the member from Mississauga Centre, who will be embarking on roundtables across the province, meeting with law enforcement, but also with victims and survivors and uh, those who are working in this space. And so I'm really excited that uh, as we lead into human trafficking, or sex trafficking as I call it, because it is Ontario's dirty little secret, we are looking at uh, girls as young as 11 who have been trafficked and coerced and having their lives ruined, and we need to do more. And that starts with awareness, which is what we're going to build on tomorrow from that important work.
work that was done by Minister Scott over a year ago, and we're going to continue to support those efforts. And I'll continue to work with the federal <laughs> government so we can make sure that uh, we have support across all jurisdictions. And in terms of our rural support speaker, uh, thanks to the members of this male members of this caucus from rural communities across Ontario who have sought uh, uh, and seen uh, violence against women, we have invested $1.5 million just for rural initiatives uh, for communities like hers across this province. Thank you. Question, the member for Kiwetanong. Um, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Deputy Premier. On uh, January 16th, uh, Catholic First Nation declared a uh, state of emergency to do, to, uh, due to black mold. 87 uh, out of that 128 homes are uninhabitable. Uh, the, I visited Cat Lake two weeks ago uh, to see the state of the community for myself. What I saw was very shocking. I saw young children and babies covered in rashes and was told about elders about serious lung infections. One parent told me about this 12-year-old uh, daughter uh, about a rash on her face and neck so bad that she wouldn't leave her bedroom. The mother worried, was worried about her mental health. Mr. Speaker, uh, two days ago, a community member uh, lost, uh, uh, the community lost a mother, grandmother and wife. Nashi Umbash passed away in Thunder Bay, seeking treatment for pneumonia and uh, breathing problems that her doctor said were likely caused by the mold in her home. Let me remind you, everyone, Ontario is a signatory to Treaty 9 and uh, such has a legal obligation to all First Nation communities in the territory, including Cat Lake. I would like to know, Mr. Speaker, how the Deputy Premier plans to honour Ontario's treaty obligation to Cat Lake in relation to the mold crisis in the community. The Deputy Premier. The Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank Minister you. Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think I speak on behalf of all my colleagues in the Progressive Conservative Party that we're deeply saddened to hear of the loss of Nashi Ombash from Cat Lake uh, First Nation. We take the safety and well-being of all of our communities, and in particular, isolated and remote First Nations communities who are more vulnerable, Mr. Speaker, in certain circumstances, uh, as a top priority. I've had discussions with the Chief and Council. We're coordinating our efforts to their declaration with respect to their declaration of an emergency response. We continue to find, uh, help them find solutions uh, for their housing crisis, and we call on the federal government to live up to their responsibilities. I've been in that position before, where we've helped communities build new suburbs, uh, build uh, housing so that their folks uh, can have safer, cleaner environments to live in. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, many of my colleagues have committed to visiting and helping Cat Lake, but this is not the same as living in these conditions day to day, uh, you know, for the entire uh, lifetime. The mold crisis in Cat Lake is now a public health emergency. Health and First Nations communities is a, is a clear responsibility of the provincial government. With urgency, Mr. Speaker, will the Deputy Premier send a community health assessment team to Cat Lake First, Cat Lake First Nation immediately? A 12-year-old girl and the community of Cat Lake cannot wait. Minister. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his uh, question. As I said uh, earlier, we continue to work in a coordinated manner with all of our stakeholders and partners under the declaration uh, of an emergency. Uh, I've had a chance to live and work uh, in Cat Lake over the course of a number of years. And as I said before, our discussions with uh, the Chief and Council uh, were very productive. We shared our profound disappointment for the federal government's responsibility for uh, housing for ensuring that they have safe, affordable, clean uh, housing. We'll continue uh, in our efforts to support Cat Lake First Nations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member from Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Attorney General. Speaker, we on this side of the House have a deep respect for the important work done by law enforcement professionals. 
we know that they are heroes keeping our community safe. Yesterday, the Minister for Community Safety and Correctional Services introduced a very important piece of legislation, Bill 68, the Comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act. Speaker, the Liberals also had a piece of policing legislation, Bill 175. It was, plain and simple, the most anti-police legislation in Canadian history. I know that our hardworking minister and the Attorney General listened to our men and women in uniforms and worked tirelessly to get this bill right. Our police deserve nothing but respect for the work that they do. Would the Attorney General please tell us what frontline officers are saying about this government's proposed changes? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Mississauga Centre for her question. Our legislation will, if passed, provide transparency and clarity to police officers, police chiefs, and to the people of Ontario. I'd like to let you know, Mr. Speaker, what Rob Jamieson, the president and CEO of the Ontario Police, Provincial Police Association, has said. The work OPPA members do every day keeps the people of our province safe. Unfortunately, challenges in the current legislation make it more difficult for the police to do their jobs. The changes proposed by the government intend to empower police across Ontario to ensure community safety. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to keeping our community safe and to giving our frontline officers the tools that they need to do their jobs. Supplementary. Thank you, Madam Minister. I'm happy to hear that our government for the people listened to the concerns of all our police officers. I believe that this bill is uh, harmonized, is uh, respectful. I know that the policemen and policewomen in my community in everywhere in Ontario will be happy about these changes. I was uh, concerned yesterday when I heard what was uh, happening in the investigations, if this people uh, could not stop a suicide attempt or if they try to save a life by administering a first aid. I'm thinking of this courageous people who uh, faced the Danforth shooting. On this side of the house, we know that our police officers have all the right training and risk everything so we could be, in sa we could, we could be safe. Can the minister tell us how these changes will improve conditions for our police officers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to be clear. Our government knows that women and men in uniforms are everyday heroes to give more transparency and clarity. We have a special unit. We will concentrate our investigations where we need it, meaning on the criminal activities within a service which is transparent, efficient, and fair. This bill will make it clear where there is obligation to uh, say something, such as when there is force used or there are really there is a death and when there is also someone who has been harmed and when there is a sexual aggression. This bill meets the needs of all the Telic judge's recommendations and his independent investigation. Thank you. Next question, member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Last week, I attended a rally at the MCCSS office in Windsor, alongside almost 100 parents and workers who are disgusted by the Conservative government's changes to the Ontario Autism Program. The new plan leaves all children with autism to make do with less. They will have access to less funding, which means fewer hours of vital therapy and treatment. It means children will not be able to reach their full potential. And when they turn 18, they will be cut off altogether and forced on a wait list for adult support that is several years long. Will the Deputy Premier show some leadership and change this disastrous autism plan? Deputy Premier. Children, Community and Social Minister Services. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I appreciate the member opposite bringing uh, those concerns to the Assembly. Uh, I know she's a private member's bill later on today about developmental disabilities, which we are pleased to uh, offer our support in the government. Um, I also wanted just to uh, just to clear up a misconception she may have. Uh, 
because it appears that they're talking about wait lists and several years and people aging out of programs. The real issue here is the 23,000 children who have been denied service by their Ontario government. Three out of four children in Ontario are on an endless wait list with no end at the uh, no light at the end of the tunnel. That is our motivation. That is why we are moving to a direct funding model. That is why we are increasing funding in diagnostic hubs and encouraging more uh, investment in Northern Response. Ontario. We are going to continue to support this program. I think it's important that the members opposite understand that this is the plan that will be implemented. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The real issue is that the minister thinks that their autism program is actually making it better for people in this province, and that she actually thinks that 14 to 16,000 adults with developmental disabilities sitting on a wait list for four to five years for support is not a problem. That's the issue with this minister. Back to the deputy premier. In 2016, autism families fought tooth and nail to get the Liberal government to recognize that autism doesn't end at five. Now these families are fighting like hell again because not only is this government forcing children with autism to go without necessary, necessary therapy, they are exclusively focused on Ontarians with autism under the age of 18. The Deputy Premier needs to understand that autism doesn't end at five. It doesn't end at 18 either. Question. In fact, there are many developmental disabilities this government must recognize that need additional supports. Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, fecal, uh, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, and many, many more. Would the Deputy Premier pass my private member's bill, Noah and Gregory's Law, ensure it actually makes it through committee, back into the House, supported at third reading, and demonstrate that adults with developmental disabilities actually deserve this government's support? Minister. Minister. I can't take yes for an answer. I said in the first, uh, first question and response that, uh, yes, the government will be supporting her private member's bill this afternoon with respect to inclusion. Uh, and I did send her a note earlier in question period to let her know that we would be supporting the legislation. But unfortunately, I, I have a speech that I have to give in Coburg, so I can't uh, lend my support uh, this afternoon, but you have it this morning uh, and you've had it in writing. So, so there's that. But a Christine, a mom of an autistic 11 year old child, said, Under the OAP, we had to pay for the, these, uh, his therapies because they weren't ABA. Why? These therapies were totally amazing for my son, but the OAP seemed to think there was only one way to learn how to brush your teeth. Maybe the new plan will allow families to choose what's best for them. And I'm proud to stand here today, Speaker, and say, yes, that's what we're doing. We're also going to make sure that there's going to be more support in our school system. So I expect the member opposite to have a word with her member from Ottawa Centre, who basically said yesterday we need to rethink the program uh, because it will ruin our public school system. Does she believe autistic children should be included in our school system? Yes or no? Order. 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 The member for Ottawa Centre, come to order. Member for Windsor West, come to order. The member for Windsor West, come to order. Next question. Member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Rape crisis centres provide essential services for women who need life-saving and life-affirming help right now. The need for these vital services is on the rise, but many centers operate at 1990 staffing levels. Yet your ministry has frozen a promised funding increase that right rape crisis centers desperately need right now. Minister, when will you release this funding so frontline workers can deliver the services women in crisis need and deserve? Before I ask the minister to respond, I'll say once again, Please make your comments through the chair, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for his question. Let me be clear, our government has zero tolerance for sexual assault, for harassment, and for uh, any form of violence against women or against anyone in our communities. Our government stands with victims of crime, and all Ontarians deserve to live free from violence. That's why we're committed to providing victims with the services and the supports that they need. 
My ministry, as long with other min uh, with the Minister of Community and Social Services, are working hard to review the programs that our province offers and the funding commitments that the previous government made to make sure that we are supporting victims of crime in a, in a way that meets their direct needs in their communities where they live and to do so in a sustainable way. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I think we all stand with women in crisis, but we can't stand behind a funding review and deny rape crisis centres the funding they need right now. The government was able to find money to give a tax cut to the 1%, but they're not able to find money to help women experiencing sexual violence who need it right now. I know that um, Rape Crisis Centre staff have met with the ministry. They've asked government for a side, come to order. when funding will be released. So through you, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, can the minister today let Ontarians know when the ministry will have an answer on whether these funds will be released? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me be clear. The previous Liberal government had 15 years to address the increase that these uh, sexual assault centres and rape crisis centres were dealing with, and they chose on the eve of election to promise much-needed funding to these centres without attaching funding to that promise. Mr. Speaker, we take the needs that these centres are facing very seriously and are working closely with those centres and with victims across the, across the province to ensure that we are meeting the needs that they, they have, and to do so in a sustainable way. Next question, the member from Mississauga, Aaron Mill. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Yesterday, the, ministry, the minister announced plans for our government to reform Tarion. For most Ontarians, buying a home is the most expensive decision they will make in their life. But it's not just about expense. Every Ontarian should feel safe and secure in their home. Too many Ontarians have told me this is not the case. I have been told and I have heard a number of stories from many of my constituents and from across the province about the stress and frustration they felt while dealing with Tarion. Mr. Speaker, to the Minister, could you tell Question. us what steps you are taking to deal with the problem faced by too many Ontarians when dealing with Tarion? Mr. Government and Consumer Service. This would be a good answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the Honourable Member from Mississauga Air Mill, Sharif Sebway, for his excellent question. I too have heard stories of stress and frustration across this province. For our government, one thing is clear: Tarion is broken. That is why I was happy to announce yesterday in Port Hope with my colleague, the great member from Northumberland, Peterborough, David Puccini, Peterborough South, sorry, David Puccini. David Puccini. That our government for the people is transforming Tarion. Our government is, is establishing a new separate regulator from Tarion from new home builders and vendors. We're also exploring the feasibility of a multi-provider model for new home warranties. We're introducing new initiatives to better inform and protect purchasers of cancelled condominium projects. And Mr. Speaker, we intend to introduce proposed legislation that, if passed, would require Tarion to make executive board compensation publicly available Response. and rebalance the board based on a broader skills matrix. Through these actions, Mr. Speaker, we are cleaning the mess at Tarion in order to put the people of Ontario here, here. first. Here, here. And we're going to build suburbs. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for the action he is taking to bring a relief to countless Ontario families. Mr. Speaker, I want to lay out some of the most common complaints I hear about dealing with, ter with ter Tarion. First, Tarion is unresponsive, difficult to deal with, and not transparent. To make matters worse, Tarion is responsible not only for the home warranties, but also for regulating builders and vendors in the ministry. The Honourable Justice Douglas Cunningham even addressed these issues in his 2016 independent report. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain how his plan addresses these concerns as part of our plan to strengthen consumers' protection in this Question. province? Minister. 
Thank you very much, Speaker, and again to my colleague, the Honourable Member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills, for his excellent question. Unfortunately, the previous Liberal government did very little with the Honourable Justice Douglas Cunningham's report. Noted in Justice Cunningham's report is an inherent conflict of interest in the current structure of Tarion that leaves new homeowners vulnerable. Establishing a separate regulator from Tarion for new home builders and vendors program will address this conflict of interest that currently exists and start to return trust to the people of Ontario. Our intent to introduce proposed legislation that, if passed, will make executive compensation at Tarion publicly available and rebalance the board for a more equal representation will create transparency and accountability at there Tarion. We, we will be consulting about the viability of a multi-provider model for home warranties, as well as listening to all those affected by issues with Tarion to ensure our reforms deal with the root of the problem. Mr. Speaker, these are just the first steps on the road to reforming Tarion Response. and strengthening consumer protections in this province, and we will continue to move forward with strengthening consumer protection for the people of Ontario. Here, here. Thank you. Next question, the member for London West. <laughs> uh, thank you, Speaker. My, my question is to the Deputy Premier. Speaker, London parents of children with autism are united in opposing the changes to the autism program, whether they are on or off the wait list. Two of these London parents are at Queen's Park today. Brandy Tapp's five-year-old son, Henry, was diagnosed with severe autism at age two. Henry is a beautiful little boy who is nonverbal and incontinent. After three years on the wait list, Henry started the autism program and has already made progress in just two months. His parents are heartbroken that the changes to the program will rip Henry's therapy away from him. Speaker, how can this government justify a plan that will deny Henry and thousands like him the entire intensive supports he is finally receiving. Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and thanks uh, to the member opposite uh, for bringing Brandy here today. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate her concern. Um, we are trying to bring forward a plan, and we are going to bring forward a plan that is fair and equitable and sustainable. There are 23,000 children in Ontario being denied support from their Opposition Ontario government. Come to order. So what we have done is, is, is put a plan in place that will clear the waitlist for diagnosis by doubling the investment into diagnostic hubs, and we are going to directly fund parents so that they can have choice whether behavioral therapy works for them or whether technological aids works for them. We are going to empower parents for choice with a direct funding model. And I am resolute in the fact that we must support every child, not just 25 per cent of them, ignoring and turning a blind eye to three quarters of the children who are on a wait list Response. is unacceptable to me. And I think it's important that the member opposite is truthful with her constituents and allows them to understand that that wait <laughs> Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Again to the Deputy Premier. Sarah Ferrans is also here today from London, and her son is on the wait list. Sarah is the mother of another beautiful little boy, three-year-old Mason. Mason is nonverbal, can be aggressive with others, and runs off at any time. After two years of desperately seeking answers, Mason was diagnosed with autism in October and is now on the wait list. The estimated annual cost for Mason's therapy is $80,000, but the new program will only cover a tiny fraction of these costs. Without the therapy that Mason needs, Sarah can't find a daycare spot for him, and she is terrified for his safety if she sends him to kindergarten in the fall. Speaker, how can this government justify a plan that will deny Mason and thousands like him who are on the wait list the intensive therapy he is, he is waiting for? Members, please take your seats. Minister response. Well, the member opposite has been in this House for the past three days, where I have been very clear. Under the old plan, the wait list was endless. For her to suggest to Mason's parents that he would get off a wait list at any point in time is 
not, it, it's, it's unconscionable because she understands that that is false hope, which is why we had to change the program. We were not supporting three quarters of the children, like Mason in the province of Ontario, because they were languishing on a wait list. This way, within the next 18 months, Mason will be off of a wait list. Mason will be eligible for direct funding, and Mason's parents Opposition are going to, be able to choose how he best gets support, whether that's behavioral therapy, whether it's a technological aid, whether it's caregiver training, or whether it's respite care. Speaker, but we remain committed Response. in this house to clearing that wait list in the next 18 months, so children with Mason will get a fighting chance. Next question, a member for Kitchener South Hespler. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Speaker, our government for the people has remained committed to public safety across this great province. The daily duties of a police officer are dangerous and the brave men and women of our police services deserve our respect and support. Mr. Speaker, the previous Liberal government's legislation, Bill 175, represented a significant step backwards. It was a step backwards for policing in Ontario at a time when the government, the police, and the people should have been partners in the name of public safety. It demonstrated to the people of Ontario that the previous Liberal government did not respect the work that our police officers do to keep us safe. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please let us know our government's comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act will better provide support for police officers and keep people safe in my riding at Kitchener South Hespler and across Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Community Safety. Thank you very much, Speaker. And to the member from Kitchener South, Haspler, you have been a very busy parliamentarian, Order. and I very much appreciate your interest in Bill 68. <laughs> now, you and I and, and many members of our caucus have seen the incredible work that our police do each and every day to keep our families safe. So much of this work is silent, preventative, and unseen, but sometimes it requires to put them in harm's way and occasionally it requires them to make difficult life-or-death decisions in the blink of an eye. Every day, our police officers can be counted on to protect us. They have always had our back. Mr. Speaker, it's about time they have a government that has theirs. Last fall, our government, last fall, our government announced changes to protect police officers who attempt to save a life by delivering naloxone. Our government's Comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act is based on this same principle. The police should not be punished for keeping us safe, and Bill, 1, Bill 68 Spons. will ensure that that is the case. Thank you. Supplementary. For that response, and certainly for all the work that you are doing for our police officers across this province. Mr. Speaker, as a member of this government for the people, I am proud to stand here today and know that we have kept another promise that we made to the people in Ontario. This proposed legislation will make good on our government's promise to fix the policing legislation the previous Liberal government broke. Mr. Speaker, by proposing the comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act, our government is acting on its commitment to restore the relationship between the government and the police to one of mutual respect and dedication. Mr. Speaker, can the minister highlight now for us some of the other key aspects of our proposed legislation? Minister. Thank you. Thank the member for her question. Uh, it's time to put public safety first. Our government for the people is listening to police, and our proposed legislation delivers rational solutions to fix the, the issues plagued by the previous Liberal government's Bill 175. The Liberal bill included a laundry list of police services that could be privatized. This created a fear that if you called 911, someone other than a police officer would show up at your door. If passed, our legislation will restore trust that in an emergency, a police officer will answer your call. The previous government's legislation did not consider the principles of fairness or due process for our police officers. Not only was this unfair, it was disrespectful to the police officers who risked their lives to keep us safe. If passed, our legislation will make the disciplinary process fair to police officers. Response. Police will no longer be treated as if they are guilty until proven innocent. Thank you. Question, the member for London North Centre. Speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier. 
Last week, I had the pleasure of meeting Andrea and Eric, the proud parents of five-year-old Henrik. Henrik is autistic and was nonverbal before he began IBI therapy. After three years of therapy, Henrik now attends kindergarten, has friends, makes eye contact, and calls his parents mom and dada. Consistency and repetition are fundamental for children with autism. But this government's changes to the autism program puts Henrik's growth in jeopardy. Access to consistent therapy is necessary for Henrik to build on his progress. Parents tell me this government's new program will steal their children's smiles, rob their words, and take away their friends. Under this government's plan, Henrik won't receive the 30 to 40 hours of therapy per week he has so greatly benefited from. Appropriate support is not false hope. Mr. Speaker, why is this government forcing parents like Andrea to do more with less? The Deputy Premier. Mr. Uh, Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to say thank you to the member opposite for being, bringing Hendricks' uh, story to the Legislative Assembly. He sounds like an amazing child, and I'm glad that you're an advocate for him. But let's be perfectly clear, and, and I hate to sound like a broken record, we have 23,000 children who are being denied support by their Ontario government today. When I assumed office six months ago, uh, the first issue I was briefed on was the long wait list in the autism program, as well as the fact that it was bankrupt. So I uh, understand uh, and I appreciate the passion from the member opposite, but I have an equal passion to ensure that every single child in Ontario that has autism has access to support from their Ontario government, and that is why we are going to clear the wait list, while we doubled uh, the investment into diagnostic Response. hubs, while we are sending more support to Northern Ontario, and why we are going to introduce and empower parents for choice for the services that they believe are best suited for their child. Supplementary, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to Deputy Premier. Maria Desse is a constituent of mine who has an eight-year-old son with autism. Maria has said that the government's plan will only support her son for two months. She is a seasonal worker with no health benefits. With services being so expensive, she is thinking of selling her home just to make sure her son still receives the therapy he deserves. She told me, my son cannot speak out against this. He is nonverbal. I need to be his voice. This is going to be terrible for our family and others. So Maria wants to know, why won't this government commit to providing services for children like Maria's son the support they need and deserve? Minister. Uh, thanks very much uh, to the member from London Fanshawe for bringing her constituents' concerns uh, to the floor of this assembly. Uh, and I do appreciate uh, Maria uh, being an advocate for her child. And if I had this, held the same beliefs, I would probably be in the same boat. But my commitment is to ensure that every single child in the province of Ontario who has autism has access to service from their Ontario government. I don't understand why the NDP supported the previous Liberal plan that excluded th uh, three out of four children in the province of Ontario with autism. I also don't understand why they don't stand up Order. and defend those 23,000 children who are on an endless wait list with no end in sight. Speaker, we are standing on this side of the House and part of that side of the House to ensure that every child has a fighting chance and that their parents have the support they need to provide their child with the best possible outcome. Order. Next question. Start the clock. The member for Niagara West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, just recently, the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, as well as the Minister of Infrastructure, visited Hotel Du Shaver Health and Rehabilitation Center in Niagara to announce a $500,000 planning grant for the proposed expansion of rehabilitation services. I've heard from many of my constituents who are grateful that our government is making the investments necessary to build a health care system centered around the patient. And I want to thank the ministers for their commitments to the people of Niagara, as well as the incredible staff at Hotel Du Shaver, such as many of the nurses who are in the legislature today, for their great service to so many who have benefited from their care. Can the minister please explain why these projects are so important, not only for the region of Niagara, but also for the province as a whole? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I'd like to thank the member from Niagara West for his question and also for welcoming 
both me and the Minister of Infrastructure to Niagara. As many of us know, there is an increasing demand for rehabilitation services in Ontario. Patients want to know that the care they need will be there for them when and where they need it. And that's why I was proud to visit Niagara to announce a $500,000 planning grant for the proposed expansion project at Hotel Du Shaver. Our government is determined to ensure that everyone in Ontario has access to high-quality, reliable public health care that they expect and deserve. This is one of the many essential health care projects we are proud to be investing in as we remain committed to building a public health care system that is centered around the patient. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, for your answer. Speaker, after 15 years of liberal waste, neglect and mismanagement, patients across Niagara know that they need and deserve better health care. And providing support for better facilities is vital to improving rehabilitation services for my neighbours. And I know my constituents appreciate the work of the ministers uh, and their commitment to meeting the needs of the families in the region. So can the minister please explain how this planning grant aims at providing the best possible care for patients in Niagara before the first shovel even goes into the ground? Minister. To the Minister of Infrastructure. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to uh, thank uh, the oh, member uh, for Niagara West for welcoming, welcoming uh, the Deputy Premier and myself uh, to his riding uh, this month, or into his uh, region this month. Mr. Speaker, infrastructure is more than steel, bricks and mortar. Infrastructure is about the people that it helps. It is the facilities like the Hotel de Shaver where people with complex care needs get better. It takes a lot of work to make sure good infrastructure is built in our province. That's why I'm so pleased that our government for the people is investing in the early planning work for this proposed rehabilitation expansion at Hotel de Shaver. People have told us, Mr. Speaker, that investing in health care infrastructure is a top priority. I'm excited to see how the development of these projects plans helps to expand rehabilitation Response. options for both the members, neighbours and the people all across this region in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Good morning. Lori in my writing has a daughter who was about to turn 18. She was recently diagnosed with autism and also suffers from mental health challenges. But she's been unable to get access to the support she needs. And recently, Laurie's daughter tried to take her own life. And that may have been avoided had the support been there for when she needed it. Speaker, Laurie's daughter will age out of the Special Services at Home program and the Ontario Autism Program in September, likely without ever receiving any of the care that was promised. Speaker, can the Deputy Premier commit today to releasing those funds so this young girl comes off the wait list and gets the help that's been proven she so desperately needs? The Deputy Premier. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much. Speaker, good morning uh, to the member opposite. Um, and I thank him for, for the question, and I thank him for bringing Lori's story uh, to, uh, to the floor of this assembly. Um, it's, it's stories like hers that motivated me to clear the wait list in the next 18 months because we feel it's unacceptable for children to languish on an endless wait list without any level of support from their Ontario government, which is why we're going to ensure that those three out of four children that are being denied support right now are, uh, are given the support they, are for their, they need for their Ontario government. Uh, he also talked about uh, special services at home. I would be happy to meet with the member opposite after question period to get more details with that particular program and have my staff work with his staff to see if there's a way that we can uh, support her uh, once she transitions Response. out of uh, into, into adulthood. Uh, that is a very important issue that we are looking at, and I'll continue to work with the member opposite to address these issues. The member for Parkdale High Park, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Parents in my riding have been contacting me, furious and frustrated that the long wait list to receive autism treatment continues, despite the minister's claim that the wait list will be eliminated. One such constituent is Lorena, the mother of a wonderful little boy, Brian. 
Brian has already been on the wait list for almost two years. Lorena called the ministry after the government's announcement, only to learn that the wait list is still another 18 months. Nothing's changed. Speaker, can the minister tell Lorena why her son is being forced to wait years for a fraction of the therapy he needs? Minister. What a great question. I could have written it myself, Speaker, because the entire motivation for the plan that we announced two weeks ago was to clear the wait list for Loretta's son. That is what we want to do under the previous Liberal government. Uh, that wait list could have gone on for 18 years. That is unacceptable. It's unconscionable. It's unfair. It's unequitable. And I'll tell you something else. It was unsustainable. So what we have done is we have increased our spend in this ministry from $256 million, which was budgeted, to $321 million. We're double the investment into diagnostic hubs. And once children are diagnosed, they will then have an ability to be directly funded from their Ontario government for the first time in the history of this province. Every single child who requires support from their Ontario government will receive it, and I'm delighted Response. that she can go back to Loretta and let her know within 18 months I'll have that list cleared because the Liberals didn't get it done. Next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Great job. Great job. Mr. I was, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, I was pleased to hear that you travelled to Red Deer, Alberta last week to meet with ministers responsible for sport all across Ontario uh, to meet with the federal, provincial, territorial leaders at this meeting. I also understand that the minister attended the kickoff for the Canada Games while he was there. As we all know, sports is a very big part of Ontario. It's ingrained in our DNA when we are born. When we're on the trails, we're running, we're swimming, we're hiking, and we're biking. But as we've seen with many files by the previous government, many things can be improved. So I wanted to ask the minister, can you update this house on your meeting in Red Deer? Great. Minister of Tourism, Culture, and Sport. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, to the member, I'd like to thank you for that question. Um, it was an honour for me to attend the federal, provincial, and territorial ministers of sport meeting in cold but beautiful Red Deer, Alberta. While I was there, I also had the chance to see Team Ontario, who were there for the 2019 Canada Games, which kicked off just this past weekend. Ontario is sending a full contingent of 350 athletes, 45 coaches, and 52 other support positions, including managers, technical support, and volunteers from 111 different municipalities from across the province. The Canada Games are an important part of the development of young athletes here in Ontario and across the country in developing and showcasing their tremendous skills. I'd like to take this Response. time to wish Team Ontario good luck the rest of the way and let members and those watching at home know that you can catch the games on Canada Games website and TSN until March 3rd. Good luck to Team Ontario. Yeah, 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 yeah. That concludes the time we have available for question period this morning. Point of order. Point of order. Member for St. Catharines. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Liam Warren from St. Catharines from the Franc Francophone Youth Parliament today, this morning, in, with, uh, at the Legislature. Welcome, Liam. And also, I'd like to welcome my fellow co workers from the Hotel Du Shaver to make sure the expansion funding and shovels do hit the ground. I'm for Toronto St. Paul's on a point of order. Uh, since we don't sit on Fridays, I wanted to give a special shout out to Girl Guides of Canada National Office, located in my riding. Each year on February 22nd, Girl Guides and Girl Scouts across the world celebrate World Thinking Day. It is dedicated to the group of girls who took the lead in 1909 and demanded Lord Baden Powell, who formed the Boy Scouts movement, create something for the girls. This year's World Thinking Day theme is leadership. World Thinking Day is a special day to reflect on issues that are important to girls and women around the I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Point of order, the Deputy Premier. I take this opportunity to welcome Angela Cooper Rathwaite, who is the president of RNAO. Welcome to Queen's Park. It's great to see you here. 
and the government house leader on a point of order. Point of order, Speaker. I just want to congratulate our member from Mississauga East Cooksville, uh, Mr. Rashid. Uh, he and his wife Sophia had a brand new baby earlier this week. Aisha Alina Rashid, and we welcome her to the world. Pursuant to, standing, pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Kiwetanong has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Indigenous Affairs concerning Cat Lake First Nation Declaration of Emergency. This matter will be debated Tuesday at 6 p.m. I beg to inform the House that pursuant to Standing Order 98C, a change has been made in the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that Mr. Mer Miller, Perry San Muskoka, assumes ballot item number 85, and Mr. Babikian assumes ballot item number 67. We have a deferred vote on government notice of motion number 30 relating to the allocation of time on Bill 48, an act to amend various acts in relation to education and child care. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.
and ask the members to please take their seats. Please take your seats. Will the members please take their seats? <laughs> On February 20, 2019, Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty moved Government Notice of Motion Number 30 relating to allocation of time on Bill 48. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethlehem Falls. Mr. Bethlehem Falls. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Yurik. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Kalan. Mr. Kalan. Mr. Sermon. Mr. Sermon. Mr. Parsons. Mr. Parsons. Mr. Skelly. Mr. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Anthropolopoulos. Mr. Anthropolopoulos. Mr. Sarkar. Mr. Sarkara. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahalli. Mrs. Carahalli. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Smith, Peter Brokawartha. Mr. Smith, Peter Brokawartha. Mr. Kanji. Mr. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mr. Bauman. Mr. Bauman. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Anon. Mr. Anon. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babb. Mr. Babb. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanigas. Mr. Tanigas. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Shamanta. Ms. Shamanta. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Stiles. Ms. Stiles. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosovic. Mr. Rakosovic. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. The ayes are 66, the nays are 36. The ayes being 66 and the nays being 36, I declare the motion carried. Hey. This House stands in recess until 1 o'clock this afternoon.